they are now instruments in your hand. You can whisper to them, you can tighten the lines, and they give you all of the power that's in their body. It's a really magnificent feeling. I named all my horses after ancestors, and I only did it because I love these horses so much. I think there's a lot of people getting back to the basics. Uh, it brings a lot of other rewards besides the speed of getting it done. <laughs> There's a reason a lot of people have started to go this way. In Teton Valley, Idaho, AJ and Courtney Wollstenhume are taking us back to the 1800s on the land that's been in the family six generations. These are the four horses that are named after my great grandparents. There's a lot of little grandkids that would never even know the name of Clenny and Reuben or Faye and Sylvan, and they won't forget, you know, because they see a, a horse with that name. Here, it's about remembering family. I'm Hattie. Mm -hmm. I'm Gunner. I'm Sage. And I'm Colt, and I'm seven. And farming, the old ways. And each year, when it comes time to cut pay, family and friends, and even strangers, travel from all over the West to the old homestead near Driggs, Idaho. With food cooked on open flames, livestock harnessed, old rusted equipment nursed back to life, and the knowledge passed down through the generations, a classic American tradition is played out. Long ago, before modern farm equipment was used, before the old steam tractors chugged and belched across the fields, it was just the horses pulling ancient plows and mowers. So here in the Teton Valley, at the annual hay day, they are back doing the cut the way the ancestors did. It's hypnotic to watch. It's got kind of a calming effect as you're going along and you start seeing that hay fall down. The hay lays down like waves crashing on the beach. Other teams pull the old dump rakes that gather up the hay and with the click of the gear, drop it into piles. It's a ballet with all these teams racing and crisscrossing the field. While they dodge each other, back near the farmhouse, you can see and smell as lunch is being prepared. It's an old recipe. The pot and the recipe comes from my father-in-law. Bubbles jump up in the old cast iron pot full of slow-cooked carnitas. The flame roaring below as Martin Flores slowly stirs it all up. At first you want to get it up high, then you just want to gradually start reducing the heat. Back in the fields, the cutting and raking intensifies. At this point, modern farmers would bale the hay for storage. But in the 1800s, there were no balers, so loose hay, as they called it, was either packed into barns or stored in large piles outside. Daryl Wollstenhume and Marvin Brisk are working these century-old buck rakes. Girls, let's go. They're talking to their horses, sweating up a storm, and teaching the whole time. Marvin has brought this old gem from Oregon. You'll step on the little lever here, drop them down, and it'll just scoot under the hay of your windrows right over here. It'll all build up in front of the, the rakes on the basket in front. It has not run since 1941 when World War II began and farm crews just dropped their pitchforks and headed off to battle. And they couldn't get any help on the farm because all the, all the young men went to the war. They put them in the shed and this thing was in the shed until the shed fell down. So this is going to be the first time that it's going to be buck and hay since World War II. Well, just like that, Marvin and the old buck break go at it, never skipping a beat. Marvin on one rake, Daryl on the other, taking turns pushing the hay onto this giant contraption called an overshot stacker. This is where things really get interesting. Another draft team is walked away from the stacker, pulling a line which turns the wheels and lifts these old rusted arms, and up she goes. Keep going, go, go, go. Flinging the hay up onto the pile. Up top, a crew led by Courtney scrambles with pitchforks, watched over by the Grand Tetons. The horses back up to lower the stacker. 
The buck brakes, push the next load on, and up it goes again. And again. And again. Like clockwork. It's interesting to see those things come back to life. to think this thing had just been out in the field, rusting away. Many of the pieces of equipment that we have are original to the property. We've restored the overshot stacker, dump rakes, the buck rake. There's quite a few of us here, but we come from a long ways apart, and there's always something to learn. Daryl and his wife Ruth use spotted draft horses on their farm in southern Idaho. It's a lot more effort. That for sure is a lot more effort. The loose hay pile grows. This part, yeah, right there, so we need to keep the, the stack so it doesn't go past that point. By afternoon, they need a ladder to reach the top, and this thing will get a lot higher. And all over the farm, young kids and old timers wander and learn. It's living history everywhere you look. Okay, we're gonna do the back first. Audrey and Mark Gom are constructing an old mountain man tent you would have seen in this very valley in the early 1800s. When that's hands-on history, then it becomes meaningful to the kids and they'll remember it. They are history reenactors, and Mark is a retired architect, so building log cabins the old way suits him just fine. Once you do it, it's kind of like an addiction. He teaches kids how to use an old two-person cross-cut saw. Didn't make any sense to me in the beginning, and then I got into cutting logs, watching the smile on kids' face when they went away. I said, this is for me. Still, other teams have the draft horses pulling down trees and dragging logs out of the forest. Deep in the aspen, it's a sort of rustic magic. Here, you really bond with your horses. You really feel the past. And Loris Luter has brought a classic old sheep wagon to the farm. Imagine an old Basque sheep herder spending the summer high in the mountains in here. A bed and wood stove. It's pretty rough in here. <laughs> and the worst thing is you can't see. Uh, you literally have this little porthole in the front that look out and you can't see what's beside you. When you're turning, you can't see anything. <laughs> Different than anything, you have to like to listen to pots and pans jingle. <laughs> I love camping in this. I just camp in it just to camp in it. She and AJ hooked up a team and took a ride, putting on a few miles, but traveling a hundred years back. And back to Marvin and his machines. Once a pile of rust, he's brought a rebuilt grinder from his shop in Oregon. Grain poured in the top. The horse pulls in circles. spinning round and round. We used to grind corn, barley, oats, any grains, it'll grind. Sold one to a lady and her thing was grinding garbanzo beans. There'll be a lot of old timers wandering around with advice and opinions and they'll know the names of things that the new generation would have no idea what it was. In the field, the cutting goes on and the grasshoppers scatter, zipping past like tiny jet airplanes. The rakes still sweep the ground, and the pile grows taller. Dinner is made in Dutch ovens, slow cooking right out of the 1800s. You've got the weight and the thermal mass of the cast iron. The cast is real slow to heat up and slow to give that heat back. And even here, there is learning. If you can hold your hand three to four inches off the oven without having to take it away, that's going to be about 350 degrees in your oven. They had a post office, and that was in my great-grandmother May's home. After dinner, there are stories. We hear about the most famous barns in America. Both of my grandparents lived there on the row when I was a little boy. In Grand Teton National Park, they come by the millions to Mormon Row to photograph these two old barns built in the 1930s, one by Thomas Alma Moulton, 
The other, a two-story gambrel roof barn by John Moulton. Well, it's such a beautiful view of the Tetons from there. Oh, just paradise for kids. At 92, Inez Moulton remembers growing up on these old farms. My family settled kind of the south end of what was known as Mormon Row. There were homesteads from one end to the other. It's such an iconic scene. I learned about the barn from seeing photos in stores around here. Back in those days, you didn't have the internet, Instagram, all those things like that. If the Moltons had a nickel for every person that's taken a picture of that, we'd be competing with Vandenberg. As the Park Service bought the old homesteads, many of the Moltons came here to Teton Valley. Like Inez, her oldest son Bill, his son Kari. She's got 43 grandkids, 110 or 12 great grandkids, and three great great grandkids. It's a large family, forever linked to these two magnificent pieces of American history. So at the Wollstonehume farm, Bay. We get a glimpse into the life long ago on Mormon Row. Here, kids learning how to make ropes and how to use them. If you're on a horse and you need to catch a cow to like doctor it or something, you can rope them. And you just knew someone was going to jump up on that old stacker and take it for a ride. We're going to lay down on the forks here. Hayden Haviland jumps on like he's riding a bucking bronco. Hey, there's no pitchforks in there, is there? Nope. Just a skunk. Woo! That was nice. It was nice. It's a little higher than it looks from down here. Now you were saying you just hope something isn't in there? Yeah, just a you know a stray pitchfork or something. As the day ends, the tools and the horses put away, the bonfires are lit. And folks reflect on the special bond this valley has with our past. Somewhere within us, there's an instinct to hold on to a better way or a more traditional way of life. Folks like AJ feel a real connection with this land. I've got to know the story of my people. I've gotten to know the story of where my family came from. And when time permits, he will make the climb to the nearby hills, savor the beauty of the Tetons to the east, and his family home to the west. He'll look down on a valley and a place where so many generations of his family have farmed the land and where once again, the draft horses work the fields. A lot of it is based in our desire to preserve heritage, preserve culture. There's this instinct for us to turn our attention to those older ways. Because here, they are saving history telling the story of the early days of the American frontier, taking us back to a time when life on the farm was full of hard work, family, and big dreams.